Good morning and welcome to today's session discussing the changing energy mix, decarbonising your energy and saving money now. We appreciate your attendance, particularly given some very interesting news developing elsewhere around the world today. I'm Adam Ray Summerson, Project and Market Development Manager for Clark Energy. And joining me this morning are George Fouts, Director at Base Power, and Michael Smeath, Global Resiliency Leader for INEO. We look forward to discussing the importance of your energy centre as an asset to your business, the financial and environmental savings it should bring, and what the future might hold for energy within the food and drink sectors. I'd like to kick things off with a couple of quick polling questions, please. Um, firstly, do you believe that CHP can form an integral part of your organisation's decarbonisation strategy on the path to net zero? As a country, the UK has ambitious targets to reduce carbon emissions, but do you feel that combined heat and power should and can form part of that plan? So I'm gonna launch that poll now, and you should see the options just on the right-hand side on your GoToWebinar dashboard, um, where you can actually post your answers. Wonderful, really good participation. About uh, just over two thirds of you have responded there, so thank you for that. With 30% strongly agreeing, 33% agreeing, 26% neutral, and 11% disagreeing with that first question. The second question that I would like to ask is whether in the current climate, whether you feel that energy costs are considered as importantly to your, to your organization, to your business operations, as sustainability targets. So again, I'll just open up the next poll. Oh. fairly equal between the red and the blue at the moment, much like something happening over the pond. I'll close that one there again. And thanks, really good participation from the audience. Thank you very much for that. 28% um, of you uh, saying that it's extremely important, 34% of you saying it's more important, 31% saying it's about the same, and 7% saying it's less important. So very really interesting um, initial thoughts from yourselves. Thank you for that. And towards the end of the presentation, we'll be asking a, a couple of follow-up queries which may well touch show us um, whether, whether your opinions have been swayed somewhat or changed given what we are about to discuss. So initially, I would like to introduce you to George Fouts of Base Power, who is going to set the scene with regards to energy, sustainability and COVID, as well as discussing how you as energy managers can prepare for a lower cost, lower carbon future. George, good morning. Yes, here we are. OK, so, so, so to set the scene, uh, we've, I've made an analogy of, uh, of, of, people, of, of a food factory uh, being a ship uh, and, uh, and its crew are the employees and of course the uh, site director or the senior management are the captain on the bridge. Uh, and, and due to a combination of uh, I mean, uh, Brexit and, and then COVID, I think uh, for, for many of us uh, the, the outlook is starting to look a bit like this, where there's some pretty heavy waves and some pretty poor visibility uh, as to what's going to happen next. And every time the uh, the ship gets hit by an unexpected squall, a, a new uh, a new set of instructions uh, are issued from the bridge. Uh, and so, so I guess um, the, the first one would be that we've got, although the food company has weathered, um, uh, the, um, or most parts of the food company have weathered COVID, uh, nearly everybody is facing increased costs because they've got uh, some absenteeism, they've got some agency staff. Uh, and they're having to do a lot of kind of, you know, put kit in and do stuff for social distancing. So we've got increased operating costs and the call goes out, you know, save us money. And then while that's going on, uh, you know, we've got uh, that um, climate change agreements are being extended by two years and everybody's got to show a, uh, um, a, a reduction in those next two years. And so the next cry that goes out is reduce carbon. Uh, and, and while um, the engineering teams are scurrying around uh, trying to get to grips with that, of course, uh, the boards have become quite un, uh, quite timid because you've got Brexit uncertainty, you've got COVID uncertainty, and, and, and really what, what that means in general is that there are CapEx restrictions being issued uh, in, in, uh, across many of our customers. So quick paybacks is the order of the day. Um, and, uh, and then finally, uh, in, the, in the last corner of the boat, we've got zero net carbon by 2050, and so uh, people are now starting to really get to grips with that, and above all, they're going, well, whatever you do, it's got to be future-proof. So uh, those are uh, those are the kind of uh, 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 challenges that our, our customers see. So 
So if you're, you know, in the in the energy business, in the uh, uh, in in a food company, you know, what on earth is the energy manager to do? And so we said that we'd offer you some tips, and these are a couple of really these are tips that are gleaned from the energy teams that we work with um, and the things that work for them. And so the first thing that they they always say is they say, don't try and do this on your own. All right, form a team. What we often have is that uh, on, on the one side in, in food companies, we've got the technical teams. So uh, this is probably showing my age. This is a top cap for those of you who didn't watch TV in the 1970s. Uh, and the technical teams, they probably already know, you know where a lot of the opportunities are. Um, not only that, but they know that if they get a new subsystem in, they'll know how to integrate it with the site's control system, with all the reporting, with the fire suppressant and so on. Um, and they're really good at managing suppliers. Okay, they can uh, keep the factory running while having quite large integrations done. But they often lack time, or they lack the skills to kind of write a, a really good business case, the type that a capex committee needs, with uh, sensitivities and, and, and other kind of stuff. And so, like Topcat, you know, they need a partner. So, uh, as for uh, as for Topcat, had Benny. So, people in the technical team need people, probably in finance or procurement. And, and, and the, these, uh, the, these people in finance and procurement, they don't need much technical knowledge, but what they do do is they're veterans of writing uh, CapEx investment proposals with all of that kind of uh, jargon and language and sensitivities that the CapEx uh, committee requires. And they, you know, they work in the same office as people like that. They're generally better networked. There may be other people that you need to buddy up with as well, but, but in general, uh, that's what we see is that uh, if you can form, a, if you're technical, and you can form a kind of unholy alliance with people in finance and procurement, that's the way to get your projects uh, approved. And then matching that is, is building momentum through, through data. So one of the reasons why people in finance have so much uh, power is because they run the management accounts and so they can really see what's going on in the business and what's important to shareholders. Uh, and engineers and technical people need to match that by building a kind of store of data and knowledge. And so it's really very difficult to do uh, decent uh, energy interventions without, without knowing where the energy is being used and where it's being spent. Uh, and so in all cases that we know successful teams, they have run a submetering campaign. And they either have permanent submetering campaign, you know, permanent submetering, for instance, with things like carbon desktop, um, or you can just as well get by by hiring some power submeters and some heat submeters and going doing a campaign over a couple of months, that will at least get you to a kind of 80, 20 position of where the energy is being spent. These things are pretty cheap, and they'll really quickly lead, quickly lead you to uh, understanding you know, where things are being run for too long, where they're not being uh, turned off at the weekend. And, and in general, most submetering campaigns pay for themselves by those very quick, uh, quick actions that can be made. So that's, that's the first thing. Uh, and then the second thing is build more momentum by doing early and low risk projects with known paybacks. Um, uh, in many cases, if you choose, you know, technologies that are well established, they can be financed. So that lowers the payback somewhat, but at the same time, it, it, it lowers the risk and lowers the capex requirement. Uh, and through doing stuff that's successful, you really gain vital trust. And that, that allows, uh, uh, that sort of puts the CapEx committee in the mood for taking uh, larger um, bets later on. So I've shown the kind of usual, you know, set of LED lighting and variable speed drives. And it's surprising how many food factories still haven't kind of properly flushed all of those out. But let's not forget the other kind of simple stuff that you can do. So turning temperatures down, turning fan speeds down gradually. Um, of course, the usual turning stuff off, things like power factor correction. In general, if you can, if the engineering team can understand it, uh, then there is, uh, you know, it's quite likely that that really will properly save you money. Uh, the one or two times that we've bumped into teams which have been disappointed is where they've invested in things like, let's say, voltage optimization, which is very difficult to understand unless you're really good at electronics. I'm not saying it doesn't work, VO and power factor, um, power factor optimization, but, uh, you know, it really helps if you can find somebody in the company who can absolutely say, yes, I really understand this and it's going to work. So in general, keep it simple, keep it reliable. You know, know a mate who's done one in their own factory, uh, and that's the way to, uh, to, to build momentum and trust. So I'm happy to take, we're, ha we're happy to take questions about that in due course, but I, now I'm going to uh, turn back over to Adam to talk about how a CHP can really be the kind of big gun in the middle of this uh, and, and also be the, 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 be the driver of, of further decarbonization. 
Adam, back to you. Thanks, George. And um, absolutely, um, I'd like to discuss now how the CHP is the at the core of your energy centre can be that big gun, so to speak, in in terms of energy cost reduction. Now, arguably, there have been three core arguments for a combined heat and power plant throughout history. Um, but as the carbon intensity of grid supplied electricity falls, the emission reduction benefit becomes less prevalent in the UK, at least, um, where we have a, 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 a kind of a high renewables penetration within our, our network. However, it does continue to be a, a key factor elsewhere in other territories where there is still a, a very high percentage of non-renewable um, grid scale power generation. Excuse me. <clears throat> Economics continue to be a, a, you know, a tremendous factor in the decision making process, but increasingly uh, a lot of our inquiries kind of um, allude to the bottom left hand side of this triangle and, and resiliency and the importance of resilience, resiliency to a client's operation. And I think that was demonstrated quite clearly um, last summer when there was significant power outages on the, on the southeast coast of the country. Now, for most of our food and drink clients, the main utility spends will be on electricity supply from the grid and heat and or cooling um, supply from boilers and on site chillers. Sometimes and more often than not fed from mo multiple disconnected energy centers. Um, so, so, you, you know, quite, it, it's not a, it's not uncommon to have multiple boiler houses and multiple chiller plant in various locations around the facility. Um, that aren't necessarily communicating with one, one another and not necessarily sharing the load with one another. So how can a CHP help reduce that spend and contribute to the carbon reduction then? The left-hand side of, of, of this slide represents your current traditional utility supply model, where broadly you're susceptible to the cost of purchasing electricity from the network and the cost of fuel to your heating or cooling infrastructure. The right-hand side represents the CHP supply model, where we have the cost of providing fuel to the unit and the cost of maintenance um, for producing the demands on the left hand side. The difference between those two could represent potentially 20 to 40 percent um, in, in savings uh, in utility spend, so to speak, which potentially, depending on the size of your organization, could mount up to millions of pounds worth of savings in, in, in a single year. The carbon model is similar um, with the traditional model representing the carbon cost of grid supplied electricity and boiler supplied heat. Obviously, with, with, with increased renewables penetration to the network, we have seen the grid supplied electricity power factor fall quite dramatically in the UK, uh, currently sitting at a level of 0.27 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. But conversely, we're yet to really see great strides in terms of decarbonisation of the gas network. So the gas carbon factor has remained fairly consistent for, for a number of years and currently at around 0 0.18 um, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hours, thus that, that the carbon benefit of CHP has been eroded. But that's not to say that all CHP is now a net contributor, a common misconception, I think, within the industry. As an example, uh, our 900 kilowatts J412 engine uh, pr provides just over a megawatt of heat as low temperature hot water and consumes around 2.2 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. megawatts of natural gas. We convert for high heating value, take into account net generation and assume we're offsetting an 82% thermally efficient boiler, then we only need to recover around 80% of the available heat from that particular engine to actually make a carbon saving. Now, certain schemes are more efficient than others and use the available outputs in different ways, but the message is that natural gas CHP can still provide a carbon as well as significant financial savings to operate to your operations. Now, as George has mentioned earlier, understanding those demands on your site is essential to sizing CHP correctly. A gas engine operates most optimally when it's running at as high a load as possible for as long as possible. But it does have an operating window down to 40 or 50 percent of its rated output, um, depending on the unit. So understanding partial load conditions such as during evenings and weekends is fundamentally important. And kind of to expand on this, if we, uh, uh, we, we can't really un underestimate the importance of, of a detailed feasibility analysis of both your electricity demands and your thermal demands, as, uh, as this is going to help determine the overall savings, potential savings from the scheme. But it's also going to ensure that engine utilisation is maximised. So you're getting the absolute most from that given unit um, 
Now, the red line on this graph represents a fairly typical thermal load. It could represent low temperature water or steam. Uh, and the blue line represents uh, a chilling load. As you can see there, chilling demand typically is higher in summer months when, when ambient temperatures are higher. Um, cool, uh, and heating demand is, is, is higher in winter months when, when uh, ambient temperatures are lower. But what this really shows um, is that by increasing or decreasing the size of our unit is that we can maximize savings or running time. But in reality, what we need to understand is that sensitivity around load variance in the middle of the graph. So through measurement and understanding of site demand, we can size a CHP unit that's designed to maximize savings, operate efficiently and improve overall site resilience through integration with your current facility. <coughs> Excuse me. A turnkey delivery of a dedicated energy centre and its associated infrastructure, it could take something between a nine and 12 month um, programme to deliver from point of order. But clearly there's some works to be done ahead of that um, in terms of planning and permitting and, and, and approvals and, and the like. But as we've heard, the realisation is potentially millions of pounds worth of savings, savings that could be invested in further carbon reducing measures. But critical to that and the success of it is understanding that all mechanical and electrical interfaces are key. So understanding in terms of the gas connection, fuel supply, um, electrical connections, grid, fault contribution, etc., is important. But then equally understanding the design needs to take consideration of local noise or emission requirements, maintainability through life. This is an asset that, that, that could be with you for for kind of 15, 20 years, so understanding the maintainability of the complete energy solution is, is, is important, but equally site resilience. But beyond the technology, having that local presence to ensure ongoing maintenance requirements are met is critical. After all, if the CHP is not running, it's not producing those savings. So understanding the support capabilities of your delivery partner is just as critical as the technology that they're actually installing. Service technicians need to be located around the country, reporting to specific, specific geographical regions. And where possible, that enables them to become a local engineer for a particular installation, helping to develop the customer relationship with yourselves and, uh, and, and develop that mutual understanding of any procedures and practices that might be bespoke to your given site. Beyond that frontline response, you also need to, um, to, to have dedicated teams trained and accustomed to working on that complete energy system, not just the CHP but all of that integrated mechanical and electrical infrastructure. And George spoke earlier of that importance of measurements, and this isn't just true uh, understanding your current usages, but also following installation. Diagnostic tools, trending of hundreds of on-engine parameters help predict engine wear, potentially preventing future issues from arising. Having these features connected to a, an install base in the UK of some 1.7 gigawatts, combined with our dedicated service infrastructure, helps to ensure that maximum fleet availability and reliability of all assets and operation, which ultimately translates itself to maximizing those savings as we've discussed to yourselves. I'd like to look at a couple of, of, of project examples um, now, and I'll invite George to kind of contribute to, to these discussions as a number of these, um, these um, projects are, are, have been delivered in association and working with base power. So the first one with Group, group Litalis, um, is helping to reduce emissions by at least 2,000 tonnes of CO2 per year, as well as improving overall resilience by reducing load on some of the existing sites um, heat production assets involving a two megawatt in, uh, containerized um, natural gas CHP set. Um, George, do you have any kind of comments or, or points that you'd like to raise with, with, with regards to this particular installation? Uh, just, just one to raise, apart from the fact that uh, this CHP does not have three flues coming out of it, I'd just like you to know that uh, only the small white one is, uh, is ours. The 60 metre one uh, belongs to their existing 10 megawatt boilers. Um, th this is a useful, this is an interesting case of de-steaming. So, you know, a typical um, steam boiler and uh, steam distribution system, you know, might have a, an efficiency of, of, say, 70%. Uh, and therefore, if you can convert steam into kind of hot water, uh, that is almost always an immediate uh, energy efficiency gain. And so it is in, in this case where we have done the partial de-steaming of their milk heater and milk dryer. So that means that it's converting them to A in its own right a more efficient system and also is providing them that whole water is provided off the CHP. And that's where quite a lot of the value and carbon savings are driven. 
The next case study is a project delivered for Cranswick Foods. Um, and again, George, I, 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 would, I think uh, a lot of our customers will customer base would probably prefer to hear from from yourself more so than than, than ourselves as, as technology providers and some of the kind of the difficulties yeah. and challenges in, in delivering this particular project yeah so this is um this is a Cranswick who've got a well-established sustainability program uh the site's in a rural area and on a very tight tightly constrained site so we had to really cram it in uh, which did a lot of uh design iterations with Clark uh and uh make it very quiet indeed um, it comes with a waste heat boiler, so this the waste heat boiler has become the lead boiler for the site. It provides hot water, again, as part of a de-steaming exercise. Um, and, um, and we also replace some of their uh, slightly aging heat infrastructure assets at the same time. So this project's been uh, very successful with them, provides most of their power, uh, a lot of their heat, uh, and, and a decent carbon saving. Uh, and I think probably this is uh, Darren Andrew, who's the site director, um, uh, you can see him on our on our website and also on our YouTube channel um, being enthusiastic about the project. I think it's been great for them, not least because uh, we brought the investment. So uh, again, another de-steaming replacement of uh, energy assets um, and, uh, uh, and you know, you can pay for it yourself uh, or else uh, we can uh, we can build it for you and run it for you. Thank you. Uh, which brings us on to kind of um, another case study with a cook chill food manufacturer um, where base power procured and financed the project i believe under an epc contract um, and there were kind of some interesting uh, issues with regard to aligning the grid connection and various other interventions that were going on within the factory's overall production schedule perhaps george you'd, you'd like to kind of talk around those points yeah, as well and this is another kind of uh, um, a, a nice project that we we did with you guys um, again, low-cost power, uh, steam, hot water, and to squeeze the last firm out of the project, it has an absorption chiller um, which um, uh, provides the, the base load for, for their chilling system. Um, so this has been running since last Christmas, uh, and, and they paid for it, as, as you say, Adam. So I think to steer the discussion onto what the future might hold, Adam, I think you've got a nice example uh, of a... Uh, of a, a number of projects that you've done which take renewable fuel. Yeah, and actually, I've, I've, I've just got the, the, the one example um, that, that I'm going to refer to of the 350 megawatts that, that, that Clark have installed within the food and drink sector um, worldwide. But this particular example at the Gervin Distillery um, in, in Scotland, <coughs> excuse me, demonstrates those capabilities of working with renewable fuels where we're using biogas that's being created using distillate from the or through rather um, the anaerobic digestion process to produce electricity hot water and steam which is then used throughout the site within their distilling processes um, at, at, up there at the distillery it comprised a number of uh, engines delivered through kind of multiple phased expansion uh, over a number of years so initial the initial project was to of our J420 engines, so one and a half megawatts each, then another two 420s as, as the uh, anaerobic di digestion plant was expanded. And then finally, um, our three megawatt 620 engine was added um, a, a little while later. And, and it kind of just goes to show the, the, the flexibility and the fuel flexibility of, of gas engines and how that, you know, we're not only talking about non renewable fuels and natural gas, um, we are capable of, of running successful projects with renewable. Um, fuels as uh, as well, and I think that's that's an interesting kind of segue into what um, Michael, I believe, is going to talk about this morning. So at this point, I'll hand over to Michael uh, and allow him to discuss a little bit about how Ineo are approaching the gas engine technology uh, and, and kind of their look towards the future. So Michael, I'll just give you control. Wonderful, thank you very much, Adam. Well, as Adam says, so my name is Michael Smith. I run the global resiliency business for Ineo. Uh, INEO are the manufacturers of the Embacker engines that have been at the heart of all the projects that uh, George and Adam have been talking to you about. The picture in front of you is actually our main manufacturing facility in Yenbach in Austria. We're very creative and imaginative when we come to naming our products and that all our Yenbacher engines are made in Yenbach in Austria and all our Walkshaw engines are made in Walkshaw, Wisconsin. So should we ever create a new product, it's pretty clear we know how we're going to name it. Right, so to give a little snapshot of who we are and what we do globally, we've delivered over 64 gigawatts of uh, installed power uh, around the world. And to give you a sense of what that means in real numbers, that's about 124 million 
European homes uh, or three times the power requirements of a country like Germany. Uh, we've deployed over 100 countries and around the world we work with over 60 different uh, delivery partners. Uh, Clark Energy are by an order and magnitude our biggest and cover many, many territories, nearly 30 countries for us. And uh, I am uh, slightly biased and also because Adam Zon would argue they're very much one of our best as well. Uh, we, we do a range from about 200 kilowatts up to 10 megawatts and across multiple sets of platforms. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those and what they are. Uh, but the big thing for us is that we are from the ground up a gas engine company. None of our, everything we do was designed to run gas. They're not converted engines. They're not things that have been lodged to try and do a job. They're very much created for a specific application to work well for uh, what it's needed to do uh, with the fuel source you have. To give you a sense of the sort of applications as well. So obviously in the food and drink sector, uh, a lot of you will be very interested in manufacturing, but just to give you a sense of some of the thing, we do a lot around fast frequency response to firm up the grid for renewable energy. We do a huge amount in greenhouses where not only do we provide the heat, but the carbon dioxide from the exhaust gases is also used as a fertilizer for the crops. We do a lot of work with independent power producers and utilities, uh, airports, waste of power, hospitals, oil and gas, essentially anywhere and anyone that needs heat or power or cooling or carbon dioxide or a combination of all of those. The main reason, and again, Adam's quite rightly alluded to this, that uh, people will look at doing this is for a few things here. Often it is decarbonization now, and particularly with where we're going in the world, rightly so, we're looking to take out as much carbon as we can from the process. Uh, this is where it's really important for me to point out that not all CHP is created equally. So, we are always very confident that all the CHP that we deploy in the UK is still decarbonizing versus you buying your energy off the grid. And that is even with the fact that the UK's grid is one of the most decarbonized in Europe. And the reason we do that is because we only put ultra high efficiency systems in, where we aim to get around 90% uh, fuel efficiency overall of the system. Whereas, you know, you, you can get systems that go down to as low as 30 or 40%. And that's why it saves carbon, but by saving carbon, you also tend to be saving money because what you're doing is being far more efficient and actually using your fuel effectively. The other thing that we're very big on is decentralization. And this very much plays into the whole piece around resiliency. The fact that you have on-site generation means that you have power generation where it's needed and heat generation where it's needed, but also more to the point, you are not subject to wobbles in the grid. If there's a brownout, our customers can ride through that. And also, again, in terms of efficiency, what you don't get is the big transmission and distribution losses from a massive centralized power station that effectively has to squirt power down cables over many, many miles to you, the consumer. And I appreciate the technical out of you there. Squirt power down cables is very much not a technical term, but I'm going with it anyway because I, I love the visual nature of it. Uh, and the other thing that we're very much moving into as well, and this is a big legacy of when we used to be part of General Electric, is digitization and big data. So what we're very keen on doing is making sure that any assets you have, not just our own, but others as well, are running at absolute uh, high efficiency as possible. So every engine that uh, is supplied by us through Clark Energy in the UK automatically comes with my plant, uh, which means that you can actually, wherever you are in the world, remotely monitor what your plant is doing. But actually more important than that, it does predictive analysis. This came from our development in the aircraft industry, uh, where aircraft engines, it's incredibly important that failure never happens. So actually, the way you do that is by not just maintaining them properly, it's also looking at predictive patterns of usage and wear. And this means that we can do this remotely far more effectively. So I think and this is a real competitive advantage for us because most of the rest uh, don't do this. And the reason we do do this is because of our heritage and history. And I think it, it's actually quite exciting the way it's working at the moment. To give you a sense of the history, uh, you know, we rolled off our first engine in the 1930s. Uh, and since then, we've been developing all the way through. And I think, you know, we're responsible for some of the world's first in gas engines, uh, such as, you know, having the first lean ox, lean burn engine, having the first 20 cylinder gas engine, then having the first 24 cylinder gas engine. And it was always interesting to us as we did these things, everyone criticized us and called us crazy. Uh, when we put the first 20 cylinder engine out, people went, you don't want to do that, that's crazy. And then immediately they all copied us. Same thing happened with the 24 cylinder engine. We're also the first people to put dual stage turbocharging in. So much like the turbocharging in your car engines, uh, again, it's just another way of making sure that you're absolutely squeezing the last edge of efficiency out to give you incredibly high numbers overall. And, you know, we, we continue to do this. So we also 
when we launched our Time 9 platform, which was the big 10 megawatt engine, you know, we were one of the first people to provide over 50% electrical efficiency out of an engine, which, to be honest, is challenging big turbines and power stations just on an engine set, which is there's nothing short of incredible. Uh, again, to give you a sense for the MBACA portfolio, which is the stuff that would be mostly relevant for the work we'd be doing here, there's five basic platforms from the smallest, which is the Type 2, uh, up to uh, the J920, the Type 9. Uh, the reason we have five different platforms is it's not just how powerful they are or they aren't. They're designed very differently to behave differently. And a lot of this depends on your applications. You'll notice the Eagle Eye on there, there's some power overlaps, say, between the Type 3 and the Type 4. Uh, and a lot of this will be because it depends on what gas you're burning, uh, what fuel you're using, where you are. And this also comes to a point that when we are putting something together for you, we don't just dust one off the shelf and give it to you. What you get is an absolute analysis of your situation, what the quality of the gas is, whether it's natural gas, biogas, if it's, uh, you know, it could actually in your industry very much be uh, waste gas coming off as a byproduct from, say, brewing or some other form of food manufacturing process. Everything right down to the shape of uh, the cylinder heads is designed specifically to give you the best electrical efficiency, which is why, you know, we've got a very proud record of what we do in this sector globally. And honestly, for us, it's far more important that it works well than we do it, because actually our reputation very much depends on the fact that we're, we're seen as the gold standard of product and we don't want to risk that. So, you know, we're always incredibly careful in the projects we do to make sure they work incredibly well for customers. The other thing I wanted to point out as well, this, this constant evolution as well. So I don't want you to think if you buy a piece of technology, it's set in time on the day you get it. We always work very hard to actually make them better as you have them. Um, because, you know, we squeeze extra efficiencies out. We squeeze extra power out. And actually, we've always done this. So all the way along, there's extra revisions. And as they're serviced and as they're maintained, Partners like Clark Energy work hard to actually make sure that, you know, if you had something that was great on day one, it's going to be even better, you know, at the end of year two and year three. And this is always the way we want it to be, because at the end of the day, we set a baseline of expectation and we always aim to exceed it. Now, one of the case studies I just want to mention, because I think it's, it's an interesting one, and it's, it's food and beverage, but it's not how people think classically CHP is used. It's with uh, Hellenic bottlers. Now, for those of you who don't know, Hellenic bottlers are one of the biggest bottlers of Coca-Cola uh, in the world. And two big plants we have, one uh, which is in Romania and actually one in Northern Ireland. Uh, and in both of those plants, they're quad generation plants. So they use the electrical power, very high efficiency electrical power. They use the heating in their processes and they use the cooling. But they also use the exhaust gases uh, from the engine uh, and reclaim them so they can get food grade carbon dioxide. So in its own way, it's a form of carbon capture and storage. But actually, more importantly, what it enabled Hellenic to do was have their own controllable supply of food grade carbon dioxide. And actually, interestingly for them, they were then able to negotiate with their supplier of uh, food grade gases uh, and got quite a significant discount because when you're able to manufacture your own, uh, it puts you in a very different position. And also when there was the recent crisis of availability of CO2 across Europe and there was uh, fewer carbonated beverages on the shelves, it also meant Hellenic didn't suffer in the same way as many of the other bottlers did because they had their own source of supply. So for me, the reason I wanted to mention this is that we look at creative solutions to your problems. This isn't an off-the-shelf solution. This was designed specifically for them and their needs. And the one in Romania and the one in uh, Northern Ireland are different. They achieve the same thing, but they're designed very differently. But it's about making sure that it works well and works well for what the customer needs. The other thing I wanted to talk about briefly was the future and the future of fuels. Now, a lot of people ask us, particularly going, this is great, it's wonderful, it saves money, it's resilient, but it's burning gas, it's, isn't that bad for the environment? And the answer on one level is no, because actually it's still decarbonizing. But we do know that actually, as the future goes further and further forward, we will be looking at alternative fuels. And what we do, and one of those is very much hydrogen. We're at the forefront of hydrogen development. All our engines are already certified as hydrogen ready uh, and can already run on a blend of hydrogen. This is actually partly because of our gas engine heritage. They, because they're not diesel engines that have been converted, it gives us a better build arch architecture to actually be able to handle different gases. Again, for the technically minded, hydrogen is a much smaller molecule than most hydrocarbons. That in itself gives you problems. Now, a lot of people talk about hydrogen and say they can do it. We believe in doing. So this plant, uh, Hashiko, is actually in Argentina, which is a test site, but is also a real site producing power for a customer. 
where we're actually looking at blended levels of uh, hydrogen, depending on how much they can produce, looking at how it works with natural gas, and actually, you know, and having on-site electrolyzers to produce their hydrogen. Uh, and it's incredibly successful. One thing that's interesting, though, is actually the effect hydrogen has. So most engines can handle 5 10% hydrogen injection. Uh, ours are happy at over 20, which is a, a lead in the industry. But the other thing to be mindful of is you can get a massive drop off in power. I mean, this gra graph here shows quite clear. Actually, it's about 27% where the actual power rating drops off massively. So actually, we were getting the experimental balance for that site. So we actually were maximizing, making sure we were using the maximum amount of carbon free gas whilst not losing them power because actually losing the power and pumping more gas is also not helpful as well. Uh, so just to say that, you know, we are very much at the forefront of this. We already have 100% hydrogen running engines. Uh, it's unlikely to be the right solution for some people because of basically where you get your hydrogen from. But the reason we talk about this is we just wanted to point out that any technology you're buying from us via Clark Energy is very much future proofed. You won't be thinking to yourself, oh, my God, I bought something and two years later, it's out of date. That will not happen. Right. And this graphic I just wanted to show you as well, because I wanted to point out that we, we sit at pretty much every stage in a renewable hydrogen power generation world, whether that's alongside wind turbines, the grid firming, whether that's basically burning biogas, methanol, synthetic fuels, ammonia, you know, and actually having engines that are optimized to actually deliver power and heat and cooling through those. Uh, and whether or not it is just actually providing base load power to make sure that actually the whole system can work. Uh, we kind of have an integrated role at every stage. And actually what we do is we don't have a set one of these. And this is what I think is probably the most important thing I can get to. Anyone who tells you they have a cookie cutter approach to your problem uh, is either lying to you or selling you a solution that doesn't actually meet all of your needs. It'll probably just meet two thirds of your needs. And you know what, that might be good enough, but we don't think good enough is good enough. We kind of only really want you to have something that does everything it needs to do for you. Uh, again, talking hydrogen, just so you know, there's, there's three basic ways of doing this. One is hydrogen's injected into the natural gas pipeline. We're ready for that. That's actually what may well happen over the next 10 years. One is hydrogen is injected locally by you. Again, we're ready for that for local dynamic uh, ad hoc mixing. And then there's you have an engine that just runs purely on hydrogen. The reality is all three of those engines look the same, but they are all designed very differently to make sure they're meeting the needs there. And I think we're the only manufacturer that's offering such a wide breadth uh, across this. And finally, all I just wanted to say as a summary is that, look, whatever fuel you're running, however you want to achieve this, we're here to make sure that you get resilient, cost-effective power that meets your decarbonization strategy. Because to be honest, we know you have to run a business, right? At the end of the day, it's not sustainable if it's not financially sustainable as well as carbon sustainable. And for us, that's incredibly important. We would never deploy a system with you that didn't do all of those things at once. And the other thing as well, which we don't talk as much about is money, but the other thing is between us as well, and you know, George's organization do a lot of this as well, these can be fully funded and paid for by output. So you know, even if you don't want to actually own large lumps of machinery, you just want to buy power, heat and cooling at a guaranteed and discounted rate with the latest technology. We're happy to do that as well. Again, for us, it goes back to this not having a one size fits all solution for people. It's about going, what is it actually that you need? OK, let's let's do that. And, you know, we, we don't mind which way you do it. We just want to make sure you get the technology in your organization that delivers what you need. So I am going to be quiet now, which I think will probably come as nothing short of a merciful relief to all of you who've just heard me chunter at you for the last 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, I will uh, hand back over to Adam. Thank you very much. So through the next slide, um, I'd like to invite both Michael and George to discuss kind of a little bit further how the CHP at the core of the energy centre development can continue to support that future decarbonisation. And you know, I'll throw up this this kind of graphic, which, which tries to demonstrate uh, how an integrated hybridized power system can work and how natural gas CHP can be utilized as an enabler, really, for renewables deployment, utilizing savings today to fund future low or zero carbon investments. Um, and, and how flexible generation ensures good stability, particularly at times when the wind might not be blowing or the sun isn't necessarily shining. Um, and before I kind of ask you, you both to, 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 to jump in, I, I would just like to highlight that there are, there are a number of, of kind of users that 
that aren't necessarily reflected in this and a number of uh, uh, not strictly speaking discussed all of the the technical capabilities you know i'd like to acknowledge greenhouse applications for example they for a number of years um for decades even have been recovering um, carbon dioxide be it from boilers um, boiler exhaust or from engine exhaust and utilizing that within the overall growing process to to improve um utilize, uh, uh, production of of um, vegetable mm -hmm. goods for example now that's a slightly different um form of co2 recovery to that which michael was discussing but again it comes back to this point of flexibility of solution flexibility of design and designing a system bespoke to your individual needs um as a food or, or drink manufacturer um michael george i'll invite you both to kind of share any thoughts you might have on this integrated hybrid power solution um for our food and drink customers and also, would you mind commenting kind of on on further on scheme enhancement or modifications throughout project life? No, so well, look, one thing, and it's almost stepping back from this a little bit because these integrated hybrid systems are marvelous and can deliver huge benefit. But sometimes people are going, do, do I want to do CHP because it doesn't deliver me my entire zero carbon outlook? It's still burning carbon. We go, well, look, what it can do is massively reduce your carbon load while you're developing what you do to your road to 2050. And the thing we're finding with an awful lot of partners is that the worst thing in the world is to do nothing, right? And actually, because waiting another 10 years before you think you're going to do something that achieves it means you've lost that 10 years of carbon saving that you would have had. You've lost that 10 years of cost saving. And I think what I'd say is think about actually how we can do this. And even if it doesn't meet 100% of your needs right now, it will meet more of them than anything else probably will. And then with the addition of, and I do like this diagram that Adam's put together, where you can actually put things together. It, what it will do all the way through to 2050 is provide a core part of your ability to deliver zero carbon. And I think that that's for me my plea. But I've, I've had this discussion with people who run big hospitals and various others who their energy managers want to do it, but their chief executives go, I've been reading that gas isn't the future. And I went, well, natural gas isn't the future in its current form. That's absolutely right. But that doesn't mean that it isn't the most practical thing right now. And that isn't the best thing for you to be doing. Right, and, it, and it's important to detangle these things because we find that otherwise people get into paralysis. So that's, that's kind of my two cents worth on that. And just in your other question around modifications and upgrades to Project Life, look, technology is always evolving. We look at how these things run every second of every day. We have tens of thousands of engines connected to this uh, nerve center in Austria that we're monitoring. And off that, we're developing, what do our spark plugs do? What do our cylinder heads do? What type of oil do we use? Uh, you know, all this sort of stuff. And actually, as we run through the life, Clark Energy only use genuine Ineo Yenbaka parts and equipment, which means that actually what you're getting is something running at its optimum, but it also means you're getting the latest thing, right? And this is the thing that even something very simple like using a better oil can have a marked impact on how much it costs you to run it and the system efficiency. So what I'd say is, you know, we always look to work with partners like Clark, whose view of life isn't they deliver something and walk away. That it's a partnership and it's a constantly evolving partnership where we're doing more and better and upgrading throughout it so i mean that that's kind of mine really comment on the mods and upgrades thank you george is there anything else you'd like to kind of answer? yeah i wonder um that to maybe um to to um, i might try and put a couple of uh, uh real life examples onto that so by by january uh base power will be operating eight projects and in five out of eight of those so that's a really large percentage um, we are being asked by customers to uh, look into installing PV over the top. That will then, uh, you know, that will sort of basically, uh, the, the CHP provides the base load and, and the PV will kind of fill in, fill in the gaps. So, and that really wouldn't have been possible uh, without the confidence in the, uh, in, in, you know, keeping on investing in decarbonization schemes that the CHP itself has brought. And in all projects that we've run uh, for, for over a year, uh, we have engaged in enhancements of those projects. So that's fine, which is primarily finding additional heat uses. Uh, in some cases, our, our customers are investigating heat pumps um, and we can help them uh, uh, look into those. And, and in most of those cases, those wouldn't have been possible without the heat network that's already pre-installed due to the presence of the CHP. So, so when we say that CHP is a platform for, deep, for profitable further decarbonization, that's really what we mean. 
in that the big gun allows you to get those expensive things like a heat network in, okay, or enables you to get it to generate really substantial savings that can then sort of fuel the next leg of your decarbonisation. Absolutely, it's the, you know, fantastic points from both of you, um, and highlight I think that that you know this is is you know, needs to be considered as the as the stepping stone technology. Um, yes, we appreciate that that gas engine technology isn't necessarily the most decarbonising technology that is available on the path to net zero, but it should be considered a critical element of that because of the the, the reasons that we've discussed. And equally, you know, this is a is a, isn't an exhaustive kind of um, a view of, of of that hybridized power system as, as george has, uh, has alluded to there we can have heat, heat pumps into this con, uh, equation potentially moving forward when it becomes more feasible carbon capture um utilization and storage technology might be a, a further consideration um with, within that kind of overall piece so thank you both um for, for your kind of thoughts in that respect there so what i would like to do Kind of as we draw to to an end and, and before we enter the, the, the q a section as it were is revisit those polling questions um the third kind of question then being that do you now believe that chp should be utilized as enabling technology on the path to net zero carbon and you know with the first question that was asked the majority vast majority of those who responded already agreed with this point but there was 11 percent of respondents that, that that disagreed somewhat with with the response it'd be interesting to see this time around whether that 11 percent have, have moved their views somewhat or or uh, or not so I'll, I'll open that poll wonderful and actually you know the the vast majority of those who responded similar number of, of respondents about two-thirds of you um or a little over two-thirds um and only four percent disagree now so so we've swayed the opinions of, of some of you now uh, Excellent. And kind of the, the, which which was the intention as always um and the fourth question i would like to ask then is <laughs> excuse me or final question is would you consider reducing energy costs as well as contributing to sustainability through deployment of combined heat and power and other low carbon technologies and on question two, which was fairly similar earlier on, um, I think there was around seven percent of you that kind of answered in the in the in the doubtful, highly unlikely kind of kind of region, and a similar number of of kind of cast their ballot, so to speak. Um, so I'll close it there, and that seven percent has reduced to four percent now on the doubtful side. So again, we've seen a bit more movement, and where there was were uh, I think around twenty percent were on at kind of the middle ground, the indifferent. Kind of ground that's reduced to 12 percent so some of you have moved into that potentially or or absolutely so again fantastic news and 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 what we were hoping to achieve from this session really is 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 um is demonstrating to yourselves you know exactly that 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 chp is still or can still be a critical part of that decarbonization strategy moving forward so at that point i would like to move into the q a session um and i can kind of see from from the messages i've been receiving that uh that, that you have been posing queries throughout the session, so thank you for that. Uh, Michael George, uh, I'll, I'll read out um, some a selection of the questions that we've received, and I apologise in advance to audience members if I don't get to your question during the session, um, but, but we will endeavour to kind of respond to those with follow-up emails, etc. cetera, um, shortly. So, so does CHP really reduce carbon? It's a really interesting question. It's a very good question, um, and, and not one that I'm truly surprised by. Um, George, would you want to kind of start the discussion on that on that topic yeah um, so so the government's view um, which uh, we also follow is that uh, because of the kind of what's known as the marginal cost of generation uh, what happens is that when renewables come onto the system but if the amount of renewables increases because the clouds clear and the Sun comes out or the wind blows more in the North Sea is that uh, the uh, the plant with the uh, highest generation uh, costs are the ones to switch off first. Uh, and at the moment, and that's called the marginal generation technology, and that in, in the vast majority of cases is combined cycle gas turbine. Uh, sometimes it's single cycle. Um, and, and therefore, uh, and, and, and CHP has a kind of lower net cost of generation uh, and, and lower carbon um, uh, emissions than combined cycle. 
uh, and so basically what that means is is that uh, um, um, uh, CHP displaces CCGT, and therefore a good quality um, uh, CHP system, so one that uses approximately two thirds of its heat to displace in the factory, uh, uh, will always save carbon. Uh, based on that um, uh, on that marginal generation, that is the that's the calculation methodology that Bayes, the UK government department, use, and that's the one that we follow too. So, so the answer is yes, uh, using the government approved method of calculation. I no, think no, it, 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 sorry, Michael. No, I was going to say just to add a small amount to that because this is something the industry as a whole has done a lot of work on because it's a very common question. So, the Association of Distributed Energy in the UK. And co-generation Europe, who are the overarching bodies, have actually commissioned quite a few pieces of independent analysis on this, which actually helped inform Bayes' position on it, and and says exactly that that actually high efficiency CHP will likely remain decarbonising against a heavily decarbonised grid in the UK well into the 2030s. Because that's the other thing as well. Even if it does it right now, you want to be confident that it's going to do it for a good few years coming. So I think the, the messaging is that you know you can feel confident that, uh, and that's a very conservative estimate. So for well over ten years plus, you're still fine. Perfect. Uh, yeah, and I think that the, the the other interesting point here is that you know yes, absolutely. If it's a good quality scheme, um, that then it it will be a, a, a carb, still achieve carbon savings. The criticality there it comes back to the point I think discussed around measurements, um, understanding your demands. And then actually sizing the unit accurately, so you know a, a good solid feasibility feasibility analysis following mm -hmm. kind of a, a detailed energy audit of your facility is critical to achieving that. And, and actually, just one thing I'd add as well. You know what? We as an industry, and particularly us, we have no issue with really high standards being put in on CHP because for us, we've always met those high standards and exceeded them, whereas a lot of people haven't. So we welcome people actually examining this and demanding, rightly so, very high efficiency because. It's what you should be getting, you know. That it's the old adage that if you can buy something on the cheap, you're usually getting something on the cheap. And the sad thing is, I think you know we've seen uh, in a lot of places and deployments in some bits of the UK that people have bought poor quality, poor design systems, and they've just not delivered what they should do for people. And I think that that's not helped the industry as a whole. So anything that helps get rid of that, we're kind of very much in favour of, to be honest. Absolutely. Um... An interesting question uh, for, from from one of our participants. I, I guess kind of thinking on the overall size of the facility that they might be representing. Um, so, what should I be spending on energy, or what should my energy usage be to make CHP a viable option? Really good question. Yeah, would you like me to to take that based on uh, our experience yeah, of base power? I, I think um, that, would, that would probably be a really good idea. Yeah. Um, I think we think for so for the kind of um, engines that we're talking about. Um, you know, so recip engines of, of some size, um, it, CHP can uh, save you material quantities of money, and by that I mean with a realistic payback. Uh, I think if you were going to pay for it on your own, so if you were going to, if the company was to provide the capex, then it probably uh, you've got a you've got a decent shot of a of a decently returning um, system if you're getting you're chewing your way through half a million pounds or more. Of, uh, of combined energy spent. Um, an organization like us will finance it and still be able to return you kind of really material savings if your energy spend is probably north of a million pounds of combined uh, power and gas. I don't know how that compares uh, uh, for you guys, um, but, uh, but that, that's how, how we see it. Half a million pounds if you're going to pay for it yourself, uh, and a million pounds if uh, you'd like it fully financed by a third party like, such as us. No, look, and I think that's a very reasonable rule of thumb, but actually also to say that, you know, if anyone is interested in this, we actually come and do an independent audit for any potential customer anyway, because actually, you know, you could be above or below both of those and it might make sense and it might not make sense. And actually the other thing to think about finance is the important thing as well is that, you know, we broadly don't mind too much whether you finance them or not. This is more about the technology being delivered, but you might find a finance solution is far better use for you because it's far better use of the capital for your business and gives you certainty of output. Some people don't want to be power producers themselves. They just want to know that they're spending an amount of money with a guaranteed set of outcome each month and that's it. Whereas other people are going, well, actually, no, I'd like to own the plant and it's fully, you know, it's something we want to own the rest of our plant. The fact is, th this is kind of like, it's a decision point for you as opposed to something we would force on you is more what I'm trying to get across on this. But the reason we do it is so that there's no reason why you don't do it. So the honest answer is have it for free 
and enjoy the benefits, pay for it yourself and enjoy even bigger benefits. But actually then the question becomes, why would you not do it if the worst case scenario is it's free and you save money? Yeah, very good points. Um, I don't think really that I need to kind of add anything to that. Um, so I'll move on to kind of a, a technical um, question in many respects. Um, you know, if I decide to install CHP, what is the process from decision to installation? What do we as a business need to do slash think about? And I think that's a, you know, it is a really interesting thing because it's not a case of just having your, your energy audit undertaken, feasibility analysis saying you should do a three megawatt scheme or a one megawatt scheme, uh, and then we're all laughing and away we go. Um, there, there is a, you know, a very thorough and detailed engineering element to be considered in terms of the mechanical and electrical interfacing with your facility, whether there's um, additional uh, heat network kind of integration that, that, that is critical with your existing boiler plant and, and, and moving from a number of satellite decentralized um, energy centers throughout your estate to a single kind of district heating ring or district cooling ring um, and understanding that kind of thermal integration. But beyond that, there are a number of other elements that need to be considered, such as um, the gas connection, um, whether you have an existing gas connection to your boilers uh, that needs expanding or whether you require a, kind of a, a new dedicated gas, gas connection. And, and equally, the, 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 the electrical connection, the um, electric ne electricity networks association, um, grid connection application, uh, that the kind of um, requires all of the, the, the electrical an electrical understanding of the of the proposed generating assets and and what they might then ultimately contribute to 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 local fault fault contributions um gents is there anything kind of that you'd like to discuss in that process tree before we get to get to an installation um uh, adam i don't know if you if you mentioned but overall so from today to switch on um it generally people should reckon on it taking about a year which would be a year's feasibility. So, uh, you know, modeling your half hourly data, offering a number of engine sizes up against, um, against that and your heat use uh, to, to, to kind of form the right balance of engine size and, uh, if you like, kind of a, uh, and benefit against, um, uh, against risk as you're going to be doing other decarbonization activities. So to, to make sure that the, the asset um, is going to be there for the duration. That can take, that sort of typically can take as little as a month. Then you've got um, development, which you were talking about, which is getting your consent to make sure that nothing is going to trip the project over. Uh, and then from signing out, writing the first check to, um, uh, uh, to Clark Energy or to Yembaka to, to switch on is between seven and eight months. So, uh, so overall, you should be thinking about a year. Um, and just in terms of payback, uh, um, the, the spark spread at the moment uh, means that a decently configured CHP project can pay back uh, in as little as three years. Uh, sometimes a little bit less. So, um, uh, and after that, then you're, you know, it's, it's pure benefit. Um, so it, some of these um, questions that have been asked about the longevity of projects and so on, I think that's the, uh, if you really think that the world is going to change dramatically uh, in, in under four years, then maybe CHP isn't for you. Uh, otherwise, it's, uh, it's looking pretty good right now. Well, and then can I just add along to the longevity piece as well? You know, we've got engines that have been running for over 21 years. Uh, and actually, it's a little bit like uh, triggers broom for those of you who think of only fools and horses and that an engine has been running there, but it's been upgraded, it's been changed, it's been evolved. So, yes, it's still the same engine running, but it's materially not. It's actually running at maybe twice the efficiency and delivering a lot more than the original one did 21 years ago. But that, that is the kind of reality of this thing that this is what you're likely to see as you go through. Yeah, and an interesting point, George, that you raised regarding um, the spark gap particularly you know when we consider that what we've seen in the UK market this year uh, with, with, with kind of market price erosion due to COVID you know this, and, and it links into another question relating to what happens if higher levels of fossil fuels um, you know reduce the, the, the financial viability of, of CHP um, before kind of the practical availability of, of hydrogen is, is there as an alternative. And I think that's an interesting kind of point if we look at and consider how whilst in the COVID market that spark gap, spark gap has been eroded quite considerably, um, it, it's still been 
a very attractive market and we're still seeing CHP projects being being um, signed and, and deployed this year. Look, I mean, I'd just, I'd just make one comment on that before George jumps in on that, which is that because of, as you say, the spark spread could erode even further. I mean, what's really interesting about this is this is not a technology and approach that requires subsidy. This works just with the market prices of power as it is because of how efficient it is. And actually, even if we get an erosion of the spark gap, so spark spread, for those of you who don't know, is the difference in price between gas and electricity, just, just to say what that is. And actually, the bigger that gap, the, the more financially advantageous uh, this is. But actually, also looking at all the different fuels we can run as well, it's, I, I would be genuinely amazed if we couldn't be doing something that was at far more cost effective than just taking electricity off the grid. The, the difference in how much it is may vary, but I would be genuinely amazed if we can't still be running high quality, resilient CHP infrastructures that are still decarbonizing, but more importantly, cost saving as well, regardless of, you know, it would have to have an almost total collapse in that, which would have ramifications far beyond us sitting around here if that was to happen. Yeah, I mean, my investment committee is asking a very similar question every time I propose a project uh, that base power should put its own money into. Um, and, and what I would say is that uh, for a good quality CHP scheme, okay, the government has made no noises whatsoever that the, um, uh, that, uh, you know, that the current state of affairs where they don't pay climate change levy on the gas fuel uh, is due to be changed. I suppose you could say never say never, but that's the, the position that they have maintained. And, and also, just being very pragmatic as well, for heavy heat and power users, like yourselves as manufacturers, like hospitals and various others, if you everyone switched over tomorrow, stopped using gas and just used electric heating, the electrical infrastructure in the country is not actually robust enough to be able to do that, which is the other point that you know people are slightly forgetting in this as well. So there's an element that one of the reasons this is being done is because it actually works. So on paper, people go, we want to go all this way. And you go, well, that's fine. And actually, it's a journey. But what you won't get there is for quite a few years. And if you're manufacturing food and beverage, you want to make sure that you've still got power and heat coming into your plants. So you can actually still be having your products coming off the lines. And that's kind of important. Yeah, brilliant. I'm seeing a high number of, uh, of questions relating to, to kind of hydrogen and renewable fuels, which I think is is commonplace to, to most of the webinars that, that I've certainly been involved with over the last two years. Um, so kind of trying to amalgamate seven or eight queries into one kind of coherent discussion point, I guess, you know, where are we with hydrogen as a as a viable alternative to natural gas? Um, and, and what are the kind of the trade-offs that we have with respect to a natural gas engine today running on hydrogen I think we, you know, Michael, we discussed a little bit up to twenty percent and beyond, uh, and also the the, the trade offs then between different technologies um, and you know where we're getting this hydrogen from, what we're using it in, whether it's in a, an engine or a fuel cell. Uh, and I'd like to kind of kick off that that discussion, if I may, by looking at two thousand and eighteen, and in the UK in two thousand and eighteen, through steam reformation, or methane reformation we produced around 27 terawatt hours worth of hydrogen gas consumed through the national grid network in 2018 was 800 and some terawatt hours so evidently we are some way from being able to offset all of our natural gas consumption with hydrogen because clearly we can't make enough um, and we certainly at the moment aren't making enough um, from from renewable sources which is which clearly important um, but, you know, guys, can I kind of ask for your thoughts and opinions on on initially where we are uh, and, and how you feel we can kind of progress on this path to net zero using hydrogen as an alternative to natural gas? I think the honest answer is no one knows exactly what the final state is going to look like, which is why it's really important that your technology is flexible enough to cope with whatever that final state is. You know, exactly as you say, hydrogen at the moment is actually not a cheap fuel. A lot of people doing hydrogen are doing it because they want to be able to say they've done hydrogen and are using a zero carbon fuel and neglecting to mention that often dirty power is being used to then generate that so-called clean hydrogen to then be burnt to produce power. So you go, it's more of a story than it is an actual low carbon journey. I think, you know, where we'll go when we actually get to the stage where we've got renewables when they're generating and there's no demand for it, creating hydrogen 
and the hydrogen is almost being used like a virtual chemical battery which can then be transported around and provide a decent amount of hydrogen around the country, I think you'll see more of it. So there are places like actually very near where Adam is in Liverpool, where there is actually a whole hub of people looking at this kind of infrastructure for you know generation distribution usage. There are some sectors that are probably going to use it more than others. I mean, if I was a betting man, I'd say aviation and uh, shipping will probably be bigger users of it than possibly uh, individual ones. I think where we will see more hydrogen usage in the short term is direct injection into the natural gas grid because we've done a great job of decarbonizing the electrical grid in the UK. We've not touched decarbonization of the gas grid because we're still basically pumping the same gas down it. If you basically replace 20% of that with hydrogen overnight, mm -hmm. that is a massive impact on decarbonization of the gas grid. And actually a lot of hardware can still run on those sorts of levels. So I think that's, for my mind, that's where it's likely to go. But all I'd say is anyone who tells you they know exactly what the future is, is is lying to you because no one does uh, but what you need to do is take a best bet and going let's future proof myself so whichever way it goes i can react to that and actually benefit from it yeah michael i think that's a key theme i think is not being uh, forced uh to take a position on on sort of um uh, as we call it in base power electrons as in you know electrically heat versus molecules but but uh, it's a much more sensible thing to take a position on uncertainty Okay, and, and assume that uncertainty is going to come on. So having a good functioning heat network that can be continually developed over time, okay, having an option of uh, um, you know, a number of uh, power sources, uh, and then also having an option to take uh, decarbonized gas fuel into your CHP uh, when it becomes financially viable. Uh, those, those are the, that, that to, to us looks like a kind of a, a, a cleverer bet to place rather than plumping for either hydrogen or, or, uh, or electric heat. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Um, we've had a, an interesting question here um, with relation to organizations who engage with CDP and the science-based targets initiative, where they use location, country-based average electricity, CO2 intensities, rather than the marginal um, CGT comparison that George discussed earlier, which, may well put CHP at a lower relative carbon performance. Now, I, I, admittedly, I've not come across this as a, a being considered within the context of a, a, of a CHP customer or clientele at the moment. But I don't know whether Michael or George, this is something that you guys have, 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 the only have thing I've come across heard, a bit more. Not lots, but the only place I've had this where when this is a problem when people start just looking at electrical power in isolation to everything else, particularly. Because actually, if you just looked at the carbon intensity of the electrical generation on the CHP versus decarbonized grid, the decarbonized grid is probably slightly better. But that ignores the fact that you've then got another 30 or 40 percent heat coming out, which you're not having to burn gas to create. And I think where we found there was an issue there was that actually people were going, let's just talk electricity over here and ignore this bit here. So one of the things we've been pushing for as part of the industry is to make sure that actually people are actually looking at a total package. We're very happy to be judged against, you know, a, a green electrical grid plus a green heat piece. And actually, I'm incredibly confident when you actually add it up with high efficiency CHP, we still massively outperform. We, we absolutely do. But, it, it, but it's important you look at things in totality. And I think part of the problem was I was chatting to some policymakers in a couple of the devolved administrations. And the problem was a lot of these guys and girls are not looking at always things in the whole. They're concentrating rightly on certain areas. And the problem is, these are complex interconnected systems. And if you just look at one bit in isolation, it can almost give you a perverse and skewed view of what to do as a solution, which could have a lot of ripples and knock-on effects. So I think it's an excellent question. And we're not seeing a lot of it yet. But the reason we're not seeing a lot of it is because a lot of people have been intervening to go, don't do it, in yeah. my experience. Absolutely, um, I would agree with that. And, and kind of at this point, um, given that uh, we don't want to take on too much of your day, and I've got a, a whole host of other questions that, that could be asked, and I'm fairly certain that, that Michael, George, and myself could, could talk about these topics for probably all of the day, given the opportunity to. I, I want to allow our participants and audience members to get back to their kind of normal working days. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for your attention this morning and hope that you found the session to be informative and beneficial. Um, I'd like to thank and extend thanks to both Michael and to George for their kind of vision and insight this morning. And of course, to the Food and Drink Federation for featuring Clark Energy, INEO and Base Power.
um, during this morning session. Please feel free to get in contact with any one of the three of us um, with any further questions or follow-up queries. As I said earlier, we will try and respond to questions that we've not covered just now. Um, and, and in the next kind of week or so, equally the presentation material and hopefully um, base powers kind of video with uh, with, with uh, a minute's worth of narration will, will be made available to each of you. So thank you very much and uh, goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Thanks, everyone.